First of all, I want to thank Vanessa and Aso Yoga as a whole for this invitation. And it is a, a great joy and an honor to be able to address my fellow yogis and teachers of yoga in Costa Rica. Yoga, as you know, is an almighty tree. The tree of yoga has its roots in prehistory, since the dawn of what is now considered recorded time, which is not the real time, but the real ancient civilizations have been lost, except to mythologies and legends and ancient yogic sutras that most people have never read, about earlier yugas. Now we are at the end of Kali Yuga, and the tree of yoga is very high, very tall, very wide, very strong. And we have the auspicious honor of being the last leaves on the final branch of the tree of yoga, before the fruiting that will pre create a new yuga, a new kalpa. This is called the kalpa tree. This is the end of Kali Yuga and a new Sat Yuga will soon begin. And we are those who have been given the privilege of ushering in the dawn of the new age. And yoga is the key to that extraordinary shift in consciousness that will enable us to become again the divine beings, not just the human beings that we have always been meant to be, that we used to be in full power, and that we gradually lost due to entropy through the various yugas, Treta Yuga, Dwapar Yuga, Kali Yuga. As the world has become more materialistic, more cynical, there's been a loss of the spiritual vision and power, more capitalistic, consumeristic, and that spiritual flame has nearly gone out in our world. But we yogis are the keeper of that flame. And it is our function to keep that flame alight and now to let it burst into a great bonfire of love, of divine bliss that will enable the new world to be born. And so I've come to discuss with you some of the subtleties of the yogic practice that will enable that bliss to become real, not just a concept, not just something we're aiming for, but something we live constantly, moment by moment, in a state of grace, Shiva consciousness, Brahman. We are that, but we have forgotten. And even yogis must constantly remind themselves because the weight of the ego represses our bliss. That's what the ego is. It's the repression of the bliss of our true nature. And now it is time to remove that repression barrier and let the bliss rise again. <coughs> let the kundalini shakti rise all the way to chakra seven and burst our minds into the ultimate blissful consciousness and transmit that to the whole world. That has always been the yogic vision. And now is the time, the season of the world for that to be fully enacted on a global basis, not just for a few great sages and saints in the Himalayas, but all over the world. And we have been brought to this beautiful and sacred land of Costa Rica to make this land into a great light for the new world to be born in, to witness, and to guide, to midwife the souls of the world into that capacity for bliss again that has been forgotten but has never been lost. It just lies under a film of thoughts, mental chatter, Remove the mental chatter and we're free. Nothing else but that is necessary. This has always been the point of yoga. 
I'm sure all of you have read Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, yes? In the very first of the sutras, he states very clearly, Yoga Chitta Vridhi Nirodha. That means yoga is the cessation of all mental activity. Punto. <laughs> Now, Patanjali was not the first yogi. In fact, yoga goes back, as we said, thousands of years before Patanjali. But what had happened was the old Vedic culture had already fallen into corruption. And the original tradition, the lineage of yoga, was being lost. It had been transmitted orally from guru to disciple, generation after generation. But now there were very few true gurus, and the line could have been lost. And so Patanjali's job, he was called on to write down the essential wisdom into some very small notes to at least tweak the memory of those yogis, to remember what are we doing here, what's this all about, what's the goal. And he said it right there at the beginning, that is the goal. Cessation of all mental activity. Silencing the mind, that's yoga. Everything else is an adjunct. It serves the purpose of reaching a silent mind. But the silent mind is the end. But not why the end? Why a silent mind? What's so good about a silent mind? Because what you're silencing is the ego's obstruction of the Supreme Self from being revealed. And when that obstruction is removed, bliss ensues instantly. It doesn't take time. It doesn't take work doesn't take prayer, doesn't even take asanas. It's there. It's there because you are that. This is what we are to remember. Now in Patanjali's day, there weren't yet any asanas, you know. Hatha Yoga hadn't been invented yet. He had the word asana, but asana meant asiento. It was a seat. It was how you sit in order to meditate comfortably, to reach the silence. There weren't this whole program of many, many postures and positions that developed later. It really wasn't until the 19th century and middle 20th century when Hatha Yoga, focusing on the asanas, became the dominant form of yoga. But for Patanjali, a yoga school was something different. And since you have all read Patanjali, you know it's called Ashtanga Yoga, yes? The eight-limbed yoga. Ashta, the eight, refers to the eight steps. Now the first two steps, when somebody knocks on a, a door of a yoga school in classical yogic times, before you're even allowed to enter, the teacher will ask you, are you willing to take the vows, the yamas and the niyamas? Yes? You can't even get in the door until you take those vows. And they, of course, include non-violence, right, ahimsa, and not stealing, and not lying, and not hoarding, and brahmacharya, that's the big obstacle today, <laughs> celibacy, and restraint of the sexual impulse. But all of this is necessary to sublimate the energy and allow the kundalini to rise. And the niyamas of cleanliness, the hygiene of physical, moral, emotional, spiritual, and the practices of a yogic life, including study of the sacred texts and complete dedication to live one's life in God consciousness. Now I'm sure as yoga teachers, if you asked everyone to take those vows before they joined your yoga class, you wouldn't have too many students, would you? We wouldn't either. So we wait until they're hooked a little bit, but if they want to become truly advanced disciples of Sat Yoga, we do ask that, because you're not a real yogi until you have taken those vows. And not because somebody told you you had to, but because you realize that's the only way to live. It's the only way to be in happiness. Otherwise, your life is chaotic, cluttered with diversions that keep the ego mind going and keep the bliss repressed. And so everyone has two choices, ego or bliss. 
Ego is suffering, dukkha. Ego is misery. The ego is always in lack. Why? Because the ego is an illusion that is alienated from the blissful self. It's lost touch with it. And it's just a mass of thoughts that create anxiety and create depression and create all kinds of fears and all kinds of concerns that externalize your intellect and make you think that your happiness lies in outer objects, in the possession of objects, and even people as objects. And of course it never does. And it leads to constant disappointment. But yogis know that happiness is not out there. Happiness is the self. The self when it's not obscured by the ego mind and its illusions, fantasies, chatters, desires, fears. When all of that is silenced, there is liberation, there's freedom. And who doesn't want to live in freedom? Who doesn't want to live in bliss? Yoga is bliss. That's the real meaning of yoga. It's called union, right? We all know that the word in Sanskrit is union, but it is union of this conscious ego self with the Supreme Self. In fact, absorption in, the disappearance of the ego self into the infinite, absolute self. The relative self dissolves, the absolute self is revealed. And so it's not really even a union because the relative self was always an illusion. And even at this moment, at every moment, you are the Supreme Self. There's nothing else. Brahman is one without a second. All of this, all of nature, all of the universe is the expression and manifestation of Brahman. We are in it now. We are swimming in an ocean of bliss. And when your ego mind stops the barrier between you and that ocean of joy, you'll be in it. You'll be vibrating with it. That's the miracle of yoga. You can reach it just by knowing that and being willing to silence the mind that obstructs your true nature. All very simple. But by the time of Patanjali already, who was reforming yoga, the original we call Adi Sat Yoga didn't even have any steps. It wasn't Ashtanga. It was one step directly to bliss. Thou art that, right? That's the mantra. Shivoham, we are that. And people used to have a clear enough, sattvic enough intellect that they could hear that, they could grok it, and they'd be in bliss. No sadhana necessary. Those were the days. <laughs> now it's a struggle. The ego mind has got us. But it's an illusion that it's got us. It's just that the mind convinces us that it's got us. It tells us it's got us. And we believe it. Don't believe it. Believe the silence. But you have to reach the silence to believe the silence. So Patanjali said, okay, let's go through some steps. First you sit. You have the asana, then you start the pranayama. And again, for Patanjali, it wasn't pranayamas. It wasn't this whole elaborate science that has developed in recent years, thanks to Iyengar and others, who have used it for very good purposes, for physical well-being. He cured his body of tremendous illnesses through pranayama and asana. But all pranayama really means is slow down your breathing because the breathing and the thoughts are connected. As you slow down the breathing, you slow down the metabolism, and the mind begins to calm down, and a state of serenity is reached on a bodily level. Pranayama will bring you to the point of serenity where you're actually able to sit to meditate. Then you begin the inner steps of the Ashtanga, the inner steps, pratyahara, dharana, and dhyana. Pratyahara just means you stop looking out there, you turn your mind inward. You withdraw from the sensual world. You withdraw from the outer illusion of reality, the phenomenal plane, 
and you begin to ask yourself who is the observer of that world you begin to focus instead of on the body on the consciousness first you reach the level of mind there will still be thoughts then you get the next step the dharana the dharana means you link with the source of thoughts so that the thoughts begin to come to a halt And when you are able to then control the emanation of thought and establish yourself there, now you're in dhyana. Now you're really ready. You've controlled the thoughts. But there's still effort in dhyana. Who's controlling the thoughts? There's still a conscious will that's separate from that oceanic bliss. But it was this form of yoga that starts with dhyana that spread through the world. The asanas and pranayamas were left behind. The jhana spread eastward. It became chan, dhyan, chan, same word in Chinese. Chan in J Japanese is zen. It's all yoga, but they just started with the jhana and samadhi. They, they didn't need the interior, anterior steps. Just go straight for the, the marrow of the work. And they became great spiritual yogic traditions. So there's not only Hindu yoga, there's Buddhist yoga. It went to China and became Taoist yoga. And it came west. Christ was a great yogi. In fact, he said, my yoga is easy. They translated it as my yoke is easy. But we know yoke and yoga are the same word. And they, they didn't dare say yoga. But of course, he was saying my yoga is easy. Probably because there were no asanas involved. But my yoga is easy. It's the same thing. What is his yoga? I and the Father are one. Punto, that's Christianity. And the Father is Brahman, Shiva, the Supreme Self, that you are. Then the religions took it out of the sphere of the psychological realization and made it a myth and put God out there in some celestial realm somewhere, made him an old man on a cloud. And, well, how do you have union with that, right? So religion is yoga. The word means yoga, too. It re reunion, right? Re ligare. We know that. It, the religions are yogas, but they're yogas with all the baggage of creeds and belief systems and all of that that take away the real meaning of it. And then there's only a few esoteric mystics in those Christian, Jewish, and uh, Islamic traditions. They're great mystics. They're beautiful. And the same knowledge, the same yoga is there in all of those religious traditions at the esoteric level. But at the Sunday school level, it's a lost cause. <laughs> and so the whole world is filled with yogis, but most of the yogis don't know they're yogis, and they don't practice it accurately and directly. They practice it via a belief system and prayer and other kinds of processes. Not that those are bad. If your prayer is sincere, it will take you to the self eventually. But if you have the belief that you're a body, a bodily being, you will not be able to get to the highest vibrational frequencies of consciousness. And that is why the yogic teachings say you're not the body, you're the Atman. The Atman is the equivalent of the Holy Spirit in Christianity. The Atman is bodiless, formless. But it is the Atman that is animating the body. It is the Atman's energy that becomes the prana that keeps the body alive. But we must separate. So Patanjali's yoga, you know, it was within the Sankhya philosophy, which is a dualistic philosophy. And his goal was to separate Purusha, which was his word for Atman, from Prakriti. The body is Prakriti, made of matter. Now we know, of course, matter is also mind. Quantum physics has shown us that, and he knew that as well. But it's a gross, externalized appearance. Purusha is the source, the intelligence behind Prakriti. But the first thing you must do is separate Purusha from Prakriti. You must realize you're not the body and have no identification with it or desire for it, but complete detachment from the body so that you can sit in dhyana, in that state of meditative peace, 
It's when you have disidentified from the body that peace can begin. Shanti. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. All the Upanishads, the great yogic teachings, end with those words. Why three Shantis? There has to be Shanti at this level, Shanti at the mental level, and then the Shanti of the Atman. We need all three. And so the pranayamas, the asanas, they help you reach the shanti on this level. But then when you reach dhyana, you gain shanti at the mental and you are able to enter the atman, spirit. That's the final stage of Patanjali's yoga, samadhi. Samadhi is when there's no more effort to silence the mind. It is silenced. And you realize that the one who is trying to silence it is also part of the same mind. And that one lets go. And now there's no one, nothing. Emptiness. The Buddhist tradition calls it shunyata. But what kind of emptiness is it? It's not a barren, blank void. It's emptiness of ego. Emptiness of mental chatter. And that emptiness is absolute fullness. Purna. Purnatva. This is one of the great paradoxes in yoga. When you reach the emptiness, you reach the fullness. But without the emptiness, no fullness. Then you're in yoga. Then you are yoga. <coughs> You are bliss. And those who fully realize that we are bliss, we never come out of yoga. Meditation doesn't end. Why would you end it? Your body may have to get up. Body-mind may have to go to work and earn a living for you, whatever they have to do, teach a class, whatever, but you remain, the Atman remains in silent, eternal bliss. Always remain the Atman and then life is blissful and life is beautiful. It brings good karma, it brings blessings of every kind because the bliss that is felt as if it's internal is actually universal and everyone will feel your bliss. So don't cheat the world of bliss, let it out. You have enough for everyone. There's no shortage of bliss. There's a shortage of everything else, but not that. So let's meditate once and that's it. Never come out of it. This was Patanjali's yoga. It's still valid as a, an approach to reaching the bliss. But Patanjali didn't emphasize enough why we need to cease the mental activity. We need to really emphasize the self, the real self underneath all of that chatter is called Sat Chit Ananda. Okay? That's who you are. If you want to know what your real name is, it's Sat Chit Ananda. Everyone's. That's why we call our approach Sat Yoga. We go directly for the Sat, and the Sat includes the Chit and Ananda. You get all three as a package. So we need to understand what that is. Sat means being, but not the being of existent, existentialist type being of appearance on the phenomenal plane. It's, now we would call it the ground of being, the source of being, what enables this world to exist it's not self-standing. It stands upon the rock of sat. The word, from the word sat, we get satya as well, which means truth. Now, this is the true being. And what is the true being? It is the supreme being. So just as in Christianity, they say God is the rock of ages. Well, that's true, but do they know what that means? It is the sat that is the very being that underlies our consciousness right now and in every moment. 
and underlies the world, which is consciousness, all of this, everything is conscious. You all know that. Nature is purely conscious. All beings are consciousness. All beings are expressions of sat. And so sat is power. It is the supreme power that enables a universe to be, enables consciousness to unfold enables the miraculous to supersede cause and effect in this apparent universe. Sat is the key to everything else because it is the root of all substance, of all mind, of all essence. Sat is the beingness that you will achieve in the silence when the mind is free of chatter. But the sat is not just energy. It's not just the power. It is that. But along with the sat comes chit. Now chit is the silent, intelligent awareness. And I emphasize intelligence. The chit is far more intelligent than your ego mind. It's from the chit that your archetypal dreams come at night and inspirations and wisdom. Whatever you're able to download from the source, it's coming from the chit. But instead of just begging for a few downloads, you are the chit. Get the whole library. <laughs> the Akashic records are yours for the asking. You are the chit. But the chit is not known through thinking. It's an intelligence that's so far beyond the need to think in language that there's just instant intuitions of everything that you need to know. The chit remains silent but remains accurate so that your karma, your behavior, your words, your speech will be the most precise, the most beautiful, the most uplifting, the most heart-opening so that you can reach the Satchirananda in every being and bring it to the surface. That's the job of a yogi. The Ananda, the bliss, of course. That's the prize, right? And life becomes that. It's, there's an overwhelming rush. You can feel it in the body, you feel it more in the expansiveness of the mind, but you feel it ultimately as union with that supreme essence that transcends all that is. We were meant to live in this state of Satchitananda. And we can very easily if we're willing to make it our highest priority if we're willing to dedicate ourselves and do a little work to clear away the brush of the banal, mundane mind that wants to keep us on the surface of things rather than in the depth. The Atman is pure depth. It has no surface because it's not an object in the world. You'll never see the Atman, never through a telescope, nor through a microscope. You can't dissect the body and find the Atman somewhere. Not even the chakras, let alone the Atman. It's subtle. It's in another dimension, but you are that. You think you're in the physical plane, you're not. The body is, but you are not the body. You are in another dimension entirely that is eternal. And from that dimension you know that time is an illusion. Space is an illusion. This is a dream. <laughs> the real is the Atman itself. And so yogis awaken from the dream and awaken in the dream. We become lucid dreamers of God's dream instead of letting our egos create nightmares out of our lives. And so the goal of yoga is to become liberated while you're alive, not after you die. That's called Jivan Mukti.
And all it means is that you have learned to become the master over the mind and silence it and keep it silent. It's a good instrument. You can use it when you need to use it, okay? If you have to add up some sums, it's a great calculator. If you have to figure out what, how to get to Vanessa's house, it's good for navigating. It's good for whatever you need to use in this world. But realize you're not it. It's your computer. Don't confuse yourself with your computer. It's a great biocomputer. Don't lose it. But don't abuse it. Don't become an internet addict of this mind. Use it and then close it and go back into bliss. And even while you're using it, be in the bliss. That's the practice. It's very simple. Staying blissful. Now it's true that complexes arise that may be more difficult to wrestle with than just saying, okay, mind, be silent and be in bliss again. And then there are techniques, there are ways to work with those, to dissolve whatever complex is in the unconscious levels of the mind that comes up and causes a problem, an addiction, a depression, uh, some kind of habit pattern that disturbs you. Whatever kind of suffering is in the ego mind, it can be dissolved because it's all based on illusion. And so, yes, yogis develop techniques to help do that. And because of that, many different branches of the yoga tree developed. Okay, originally it was just this one root and, and trunk, which was, thou art that, I and the Father are one, we are all Shiva, punto, bliss. Okay, then of course, more kinds of yoga developed. The first branch was called Raja Yoga. Now, Raja Yoga specializes in meditation because the Raja means king or sovereign, and it's the yoga to become sovereign over your mind, and you do that by reaching samadhi. So, Raja Yoga are all the techniques and elaborations that developed over the centuries to be able to meditate. When it became difficult to just silence your mind with your will, you could stare at a candle flame, you could chant mantras, do kirtan, you could do whatever you needed to get into that more inward state. And, and you could do japa and ajapa. There are all these many techniques, but all of it was preliminary to reach the dhyana and the samadhi. But it's still the king of the yogas, and it is the yoga to become master over the self. But even that became something that was too subtle and difficult, so they needed to develop a yoga that explained Raja Yoga, and that was Jnana Yoga. The word Jnana means knowledge. So this became the metaphysics of yoga. It explained the whole universe, Brahman, the gunas, why your, your ego starts out in a tamasic state. It wants it lethargy, it wants to space out, it wants to have a glass of beer, it doesn't want to go into samadhi, why is that? And how can we make it less dense and less in ignorance? The next stage is the, the rajasic ego, here's the opposite. Now you're hyperactive, you're a workaholic, and you're busy making plans to achieve samadhi, but the plans never end, you never quite get there, right? Most people oscillate between rajas and tamas, it's called being bipolar. <laughs> and most people never reach the third guna, the sattva guna. That's the key. Now the sattva guna is not sat, but it is open to sat. It's transparent to the transcendence of sat. It can feel those energies and they can rise so that you can jump the gap from the sattvic ego to the sat itself and realize you are that. So we need to make our ego sattvic. That's really what the yamas and niyamas are for, and then all the other practices. When the mind is purified, lucid, clear, it's more easy to awaken to the higher consciousness. And so the jnana yoga explains all that and explains many things, many subtle things about the nature of time and 
the nature of prakriti. It includes many elements like healing, pranic healing and other kinds, Ayurveda. All of those are within the, that branch of the jnana. And then there's the branch that deals with the subtle thoughts we have when we're asleep. That's called Swapna Yoga. The early yogis were dream interpreters. They understood that the dreams are messages from the Atman to give to your waking ego in order for it to understand its own unconscious, take out the knots, remove them, and be free. Those are now what we would call archetypal dreams. We also get other dreams that are more garbage in, garbage out, but that's because the ego is wallowing in garbage during the day. So, of course, it's going to be shown this is where you're at including if you get a nightmare, take that very seriously as a warning. Don't, don't deny it. It's a, it's a sign that you're on a bad path that could lead to some bad outer karma. If you don't deal with it while it's still an inner nightmare, it will become an outer nightmare. So pay attention to your dreams. They're both warnings, they're premonitions, predictions. They are wisdom coming from the higher levels. And there's a whole science of dream interpretation and uh, dream yoga that's part of the Swapna branch, part of what we study also, that's Sat Yoga. Then, of course, Karma Yoga. How do you act in the world? How do you act so that not to make any bad karma? How do you act while remaining in Atman consciousness? How do you relate to other people in divine love so there are no conflicts? so that you can create community together, so that yogis can live together and synergize our energies like we're doing today to create an energy field that will make us all easily able to go into the highest state of consciousness. So karma yoga, very important to help you navigate your life. And it's a, a subtle and a, a vast science unto itself. And then the science of speech, we call it Mahavakya Yoga. Mahavakyas are originally those mantras, those words of wisdom, like Tatwa Masi and Shiva Ham, all of those. But it is also the capacity to speak with pure, powerful speech that reaches through the ego shell and touches the heart and awakens the spirit of the one whom you're speaking to. And it too is a great deep science. Not only to know how to speak and when to speak, but when to be silent. Because silence is the real speech, the highest speech. And so yogis aren't addicted to chatter and talk and chatting and all of that. Silence is preferred. And speech is used when it can be an instrument for the upliftment of the other not for the enmeshment with the other ego. There's no interest in that. There are, yogis live in a state of vairagya, which is dispassion. Dispassion from the world of illusion and complete union with the real. So all of these yogas were part of the original yoga but became specialized branches. And in addition to these, there were others. Some of them lesser of importance, some are greater. But the ultimate yoga that was developed is called Nisarga yoga. Nisarga means the natural yoga. Sometimes it's called Sahaja yoga. And its highest state is called Sahaja Nirvikalpa Samadhi. I believe that the greatest teacher of the modern age of this path was Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharshi, who taught that all you need to do is remember yourself. Ask the question, who am I? But not ask it mentally. Ask it in the sense of feeling it, feeling the self, silently, the I, feeling the source of the I, not the word I. The word I is already a loss. Now you're in representation. The word I or yo or 
ish or whatever language you're speaking. As soon as you get into the realm of language, you've lost it. And so when you ask I, you're asking, who is thinking the I thought? But you separate the I thought from the I. The I is presence. It's the shunyata. And so what Ramana taught is, be in that state constantly. It is your natural state. Make it natural again. And if you make that your practice, it's this, it, it has become mindfulness practice, right, in, in the Buddhist tradition. But what you are mindful of is not just what the outer body is doing, but you're mindful of who is it that you are while the body and mind are in action. That the self is always inactive, immovable, silent presence. And when you're in that state, there will be no fear, there will be no confusion. There will be nothing that will cut the current of the blissful energy. And so in Sat Yoga, we integrate all of these branches. And our sadhana is simply to live as the Supreme Self. Not trying to impress someone else that you are that, because then you would fall instantly, but to be it, really. And because when you are that, that self is not an individual. You will no longer identify as, oh, I'm this. You won't look in the mirror to see what you look like, because you don't show up in any mirrors. <coughs> the Supreme Self is all of us, all of us. We are one. It's that oneness that is recognized. And it's because we are one that community is possible. Without the realization of oneness, no matter how hard you try to create a community, you'll just get a clash of egos, power struggles, schisms, and all of the kinds of ruptures that have destroyed so many communities that haven't resonated at that high vibrational level. So it must be real. It must be a holy communion through the realization of the non-dual perception of the world as the same self in many bodies. That's why if you look at the icons of the gods and goddesses in India, very often you see one body with a thousand arms, right? It represents a community in which everyone is another hand in that community and everyone's giving a helping hand, but there's one head, one mind. The demons on the other hand, like Ravana in the Ramayana, are shown with eight heads. One body, two arms, but eight heads. They're always fighting with each other, arguing. So you'll either create a, a Rama community or a Ravana community. Yogis must create communities of Ram. And now it is extremely important to create communities. Because the lifestyle that we have gotten used to in Kali Yuga is about to end. I don't think this is news to anyone. For so many reasons, it would take me too long to list them all. We all know about climate change, which is going much, much faster than anyone admits in the news. The death, the die-off of so many species, pollution of our water, air, our earth. the corruption of the, the genetic manifold with Monsanto and others destroying the food supply. And of course the droughts and the floods that are destroying the food anyway, plus the pestilence and the other plagues. This is the apocalyptic time. There's no doubt about it. But it's not something to be worried about. This is the time in which the bliss will emerge and bring the new age into being. But the, there will be a time of tribulations. We have already entered into it. But wait, 
until the financial system has collapsed. And the oil shortage means you can't fill up your car with gas anymore, and the electric grid doesn't work very well, and you turn on your tap and the water doesn't come out, or water that's undrinkable comes out. All of that will happen everywhere, even in Costa Rica. And so we need to form into communities because one person can't survive alone. We need to work together. We need to synergize our energies and our capacities. We need to grow food. Don't depend on mas por menos. The shelves will be empty. Where are you going to get your food? We need to be able to have sattvic lifestyles away from the cities that will be collapsing in earthquakes. Don't think that won't happen in San Jose. We need to be prepared for all of that, but not out of fear. I don't recommend fear at all. I'm not preaching fear. I'm not preaching worry. I'm preaching bliss. <laughs> but prudence as well, recognition of the nature of the time we're in, we are about to enter the kingdom of heaven, but you don't enter that without a lot of birth pangs. And they are happening, and there will be more wars of a much greater kind that will shake the empire and the system and will destroy the present corrupt, oppressive, and dying civilization and put it out of its misery. We don't have to lift a finger to help do that, but we do have to be worthy of the successor civilization. We have to be worthy of a Satyuga, a golden age, a state of higher consciousness than humans have ever reached before in our recorded history. We have to be resonating at Satchidananda, nothing less. And not just giving lip service to that idea, it has to be real. Yogis are awakened to that. Yogis are in the avant-garde of that because yoga has always been a way of preparing for this. So that those beings who are lost and frightened and anxious and confused can meet a yogi and the yogi will say, calm, be at peace, fear not. That was Buddha's great expression. All those statues of Buddha are just to communicate that truth. Fear not. This is illusion. Don't be fooled by the illusion. The illusion is changing very radically, <coughs> but it is all a blessing, a great blessing. Mother Gaia is taking care of us. We need not fear, <coughs> but we should ride the wave. Don't get drowned by the wave. Fly with the wave of bliss that Gaia is taking us on into the new world. Yes, celebrate it, but celebrate it not from the ego, but celebrate it as the bliss <coughs> itself. You are the wave of bliss. And if you are that, you will guide those who can feel the energy, see the light, and have earned karmically the merit to enter into the new age. Each of you, as yoga teachers, is meant to be a guide into Satyuga. Nothing less. <coughs> but first you must guide yourself there. The kingdom of heaven is within. It is Brahman. It is Shiva. You are that. Be it. Dissolve the ego obstructions and reach liberation in life. then you are a true yogi. How many of you are in yoga to do that? <coughs> I know you're all too humble to admit it. There's one. Good. But this is the time. There isn't much margin of time left before it all hits the fan. And it's not that easy, to, even though we say it's easy yoga, but to get rid of all of the accumulated obstructions from many, many lifetimes. Because all of you here are old souls. This isn't your first time around. 
this wheel of rebirth. And there are many sanskaras for many lives that need to be purified. They'll all come up in your meditation. But they come up just to say goodbye, to be released forever, so that that purity of the original self, the Buddha nature, emerges again. And it doesn't really take time at all, because time is an illusion, so how could it? It takes the intensity of desire for that one thing, for that one realization. When all of your diffused desires for other things are fused into a single laser beam of mental energy focused on achieving liberation, it will be done like that. It's just a matter of gathering up your inner forces and collecting them into a single one-pointed focus. And maintain that focus until you have broken through the illusion. And once in the silence, you are free. And then just by sitting in that silence, the silence will do the rest. It will dissolve those sanskaras automatically. You don't do anything. There's no longer a you to do anything. God does it all. But we have to reach that state of total surrender to the Supreme Light. And then the liberated life is ours to share, to transmit, to help the world move into the new age easily and effortlessly and without suffering, without pain. We can minimize all that. If enough of us create an energy field of bliss, then all of that apparent misery out there will change miraculously. It doesn't have to be a hell realm as it's so often depicted in other traditions. It can be a very easy birth but there have to be enough of us resonating at that high level that we just slide into the next Satyuga. And the world is transformed miraculously through the magic of our God consciousness. Those of you who have studied great saints of every tradition, you know that miracles are real. Don't you? Do you all know that miracles are real? Well, if one saint can create a, a miracle of healing someone at a distance or changing the weather pattern somewhere, what can whole communities of liberated yogis achieve to transform our planet? Because the noosphere, the sphere of consciousness that surrounds the, the biosphere, governs it as well. The only problem today is the noosphere is fragmented and full of chaos because we're full of neurotic egos rather than liberated beings in the noosphere. If we create a critical energy level of liberated yogis, all of this will transform with pure celebration and, that, and no suffering. It can happen, but we have to be dedicated and we have to say, I'm going first, not let's see if they do it, then I'll go and do it. And so I know that those who are here today are serious yogis, and that you want to do it first. You don't need to wait and see someone else do it to get the proof that it's possible. You already know and you know there's nothing else really to do with your life anyway. 